What's up everybody, it's Tanner with Built Not Bought and today we're gonna tackle a massive white oak table for a beautiful dining room overlooking the James River. Stay to the end to see it completed. Just like always, we're gonna jump right into the build process. Off camera, I milled all of these boards and I had to glue this up in multiple sections because the span of this tabletop is just much wider than I feel comfortable doing all in one glue up. This table is going to be six and a half feet in diameter, which is the largest or widest glue up that I've ever done. So I did this in three sections. This is one section from here. The next one is from here to there. And then the last one is these four. There's just no way that I could have easily done this without doing small increments first. Extensions, I bought these little couplers to go onto these 48, 48 inch bars because I figured I'll be able to use these four foot bars regularly and I'm only out a coupler. And then combining my parallel clamps, I was able to get the full span here. And this is the most important thing, is adequate squeeze out all the way across this whole seam which means I got good clamping pressure. I didn't use dominoes on this glue up because when I cut this circle out, I didn't want to risk having any of those dominoes exposed after the cut. With that being said, there's a lot more cleanup work than there typically is on the tabletops after the glue up. So I got my hand planed out and started leveling everything out to the best of my ability. Up next, I'm gearing up to cut out a circle. And in my opinion, one of the worst things that you could spend money on is a circle cutting jig. I have one off to the side beside me on my workbench, but that one wasn't quite long enough. So I just grabbed this scrap piece of MDF. All you have to do is pre-drill the holes that line up with your router and grab some screws and run them through the bottom side and rub paste wax all over it. And then I take and plunge that bit through the router so I have a measuring reference. Once you have that reference hole, all you have to do is figure out whatever radius you want your circle to have and take a tape measure, measure from that reference hole out and make a mark there and drill another hole. And the first circle cutting jig I had, I made several reference holes all at once. This one, I just did the one that I needed, but I can add more as simple as drilling an, an additional hole. It may look like I'm struggling here trying to flip this top and that's because I did a little bit of math and this white oak top weighs near 400 pounds and moving that by yourself is extremely difficult. I would like to get some sort of a wench system in my shop. If you have one in yours or have any suggestions, I'd love to hear it in the comments below. And right here is where things got extremely sketchy. I had to reach back with my feet to move these tables and the worst part was I locked all those caster wheels so they didn't just slide easily. I had to drag the wheels across the floor on both sides while holding a 400 pound top. Yikes, this was bad news. I don't recommend this. This is where injuries could easily happen. I need to get a hired hand. Thankfully, with a little boost of the dad strength, I was able to get this thing flipped over so that I can drill a hole and make the circle on the bottom side. I'm already dreading having to flip this thing back over during the sanding and in the finishing process. Before making any cuts, I like to do just an air pass with no bit or anything in it to make sure that little hole that I drilled in my circle jig doesn't go off the edge anywhere and that makes sure that I have a perfect circle in the end. It's worth that extra time. I was only able to get about three quarters of the way through this material with my router bit and I wanted to remove as much excess weight as possible so I grabbed my track saw and cut off every corner around the circle and each of these corners was like 50 pounds so it lightened the load quite a bit. Up next I grabbed my jigsaw and I was going to try to work my way towards that cut line and remove the rest of the bulk material. Unfortunately the blade on my jigsaw was not long enough and on the upstroke it would retract too far up into the lumber and get hung up and bind and this was an accident waiting to happen so I ended up just stopping and using my track saw to clear out all of that excess material. With all of that excess material gone, it's time to use the flush trim bit to get everything nice and perfect. This is a monstrous flush trim bit that I got off of Amazon, but it works great for eight quarter material. Let's 
Let's put the top aside and start working on the base. I'm going to be building a trapezoid base for this table and I'm really excited about it. I've never done one before. I think it's going to look really cool when it's all done. I had to make four separate panels like this. Pro tip, let your glue set up for about 20 minutes to a half hour and then scrape it off with a paint scraper and it'll be the easiest and best cleanup you've ever done. With these panels all cleaned up and out of the glued clamps, it's time to get a compound miter cut laid out on each of them. I did about a 13 degree angle and it also needs to be cut at a 45 degree miter, which makes it a compound cut because you're cutting two angles at once. This was way too much math for my liking. I've always struggled with math and man, the gears were turning in my head and I double and triple checked everything before I made these cuts and here's how it looks. With the sides cut at that 13 and 45 degree compound miter, I also need to do the top and the bottom. So I grabbed a piece of scrap material and cut it to 13 degrees as a reference on my table saw and ran both sides through. I actually made a big mistake here and later on in the video you're going to see how I fix this. Stay tuned for that. I put two dominoes in each of these panels and these dominoes are going to be like an extra set of hands during the glue up. They're going to prevent this thing from moving around and help me get everything clamped together nicely because this glue up is going to be a wild one. I don't know if I'm just getting a little bit more wise over the years but something I've started to do on pretty much every project is dry fit everything before I throw glue on it. In the past I would get too excited about projects and then throw glue on them straight away and try and glue them up and it was always a fight. This helps so much. Well, I got the dry fit all together, but it seems like something always has to go wrong. Check this out. Seems looking pretty good. Need to get a clamping block system for these, uh, these two corners here to pull this tight. But what's wrong with the top bevel on this? I cut it the wrong direction. So it's slanted inward. It was supposed to be 13 degrees slanted outward so that it would be flat. So the top could sit on it flat. So I'm gonna have to pull this all apart again and recut that bevel on all four of these. Another tip I'd recommend is leave all your pieces a little bit longer than they need to be in the final project. Thankfully I had some cushion here and I was able to make this mitered cut the opposite way and still get the height that I needed out of the base. It's now time for that dreaded glue up, but taking that extra time and double checking everything makes these difficult glue ups go a little bit better. I was able to get everything in the clamps and I was really happy with how all the joints were nice and tight and I had good squeeze out from top to bottom. While the base was in the clamps and that glue was setting up, I focused my attention back on the top and I started filling any cracks, knots and voids and then took out my sander to get everything nice and smooth. I wanted to add an elegant edge profile to this dining table, so I did a double edge, if you want to call it that. It's undercut on the bottom and then rounded over on the top, and I just think this looks so clean on round tabletops especially. I had a few ideas on how I was going to mount this heavy top to the base, and ultimately I decided on this. I routed out another circle on the underside of the table, and then I took a surfacing bit and cut out the entire interior of that circle to make a little bit of a recess for a plywood plate to sit inside. I also added some C-channel to hold the table flat over time. There's many people that think it's unnecessary to add C-channel to dining table tops, and for the most part I would agree with them as long as the base acts somewhat similar to the C-channel and holds everything flat. If you've got kind of a free-floating table like this one is, or if your tabletop is larger than 36 inches, I recommend using C-channel. Before I attach the top to the base, I wanna make sure that everything is nice and flush and level. So I got my laser out and the straight edge and I traced that laser line all the way around the underside of this table. Once I had everything where I wanted it to be, I grabbed my planer and just planed down to that lasered line all the way around the bottom side. Since the base was upside down, I figured now would be a perfect time to add the threaded leg levelers. 
This is a simple process that makes every piece of furniture a little bit better. Flipping the base over, I gave the top the exact same treatment as the bottom, and now it's time to attach that round piece of plywood. And to do this, I drew layout lines everywhere, pre-drilled holes, and then countersunk some Torx bits into the base. Well guys, I added uh, some of these Hunter green Torx bit screws because I thought the green showing through would be a really nice accent. And uh, yeah, this is it. Let me know in the comments what you think. You don't like it? All right, it's fine. I'll do a different one. Okay guys, this is super, super nerve-wracking, if you will. And here's why. A, I suck at math. You know, that just makes life hard altogether. B, I have to trust math right now. And that is a relationship that I've just never been able to, to trust. So I have to make sure I drill my hole less than that or I'm gonna poke through. Trust the calipers and the calculator. Also, as if this couldn't already be worse, I have to have this hanging off the edge like this to get to where my hole layout is. So I have to shim up this side so that I'm somewhat stable. So that All right, here goes nothing. It's time to drill the holes for the threaded inserts that are going to attach everything together. And son of a, right through the top. Just kidding. Everything worked out perfect. The math didn't fail me. Somebody write this down in a notebook because this has never happened. When installing threaded inserts, I like to add a little bit of Starbond CA glue to help hold them in place. If you'd like to purchase some Starbond CA glue and save a little bit of money, you can use my promo code BUILT at checkout. I greatly appreciate it. At this point, my back was killing me, so I called my wife out to the shop to help me move this table onto the base. If you look into the background, Isla was trying to get out of her stroller and help us out. I can't wait till she's old enough to give me a handout in the shop. I'm really looking forward to it. Somebody start the final countdown because we're almost done here. A little bit of touch up sanding and then it's time to throw some Rubio mono coat down on the top. I use Rubio a lot. I think it's a great finish and I love the way that this all came together. Stay to the end so you can see this beauty in its forever home. You will not regret it. All right, buffing out that Rubio is a lot more work than it looks like. Uh, I worked up a pretty good sweat there, but it was all worth it because this beauty is done and I'm so excited about it. I'd love to hear in the comments below what you think about it. Giant round table with a cool trapezoid base, a ton of work, extremely heavy, but dang it, does it look good.